to context, functional constipations account for about 30% of uh, children's, certainly in the Western world. And whereas Hirschsprung disease uh, has a prevalence much, much lower. Than that. So when rectal biopsy became the gold standard for definitive diagnosis in 1950s, I wonder what our positive pickup rate was. And if you look at the data from Leeds and from Southampton, it was consistently around about 12% pickup rate. So that's clearly a reflection of our patient selection for this modality uh, being slightly deficient. And I wanted to know why. And I think part of the problem is that when a child presents as the Hirschsprung disease is a broad spectrum from a neonate with distensions, uh, you know, with radiological evidence to a sort of young child who has got very severe constipations. And it's really hard to say within this spectrum who needs a rectal biopsy. So even the indication as a starter is already a difficulty for all of us. In the UK, um, we primarily do two types of rectal biopsy. One is a suction rectal biopsy, which according to Professor Puri's data on the meta-analysis is very safe, uh, and, but has got around about 10% uh, inadequate biopsy rate. Um, this is very slightly different from our experience, I must say. Uh, the data from Chelsea and Westminster would be about 4% inadequate biopsy rate. But nonetheless, it is what in the literature is. But we also do open rectal biopsy, uh, particularly in older children, to get a definitive uh, diagnosis. But it is pro the problem is that it does involve a general anesthesia and therefore more resource intensive. So this is, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar, is, is the Thames barrier on the east side of London of River Thames. And the barrier is a, is a flood gate, if you like. It, it's to stop floods from coming in from the North Sea into London. And it was built about four decades ago and it has prevented London from being swarmed and flooded with water. And I think it is with this concept in mind that we have the NICE guidelines which was initially published in 2010 and updated in 2017, really trying to put a stop into lots and lots of constipation being put through to surgeons to perform a rectal biopsy to prevent Hirschsprung disease. And what it says is very specific. It says do not perform a rectal biopsy unless you have one of the five um, presentations. Either you have delayed passage in recovery more than 48 hours or constipation in the first few weeks of life. You have chronic distension with vomiting, family history of Hirschsprungs, Hirschsprungs. or spring growth in the presence of the above. And there's a, a link for you, those who are interested. But the problem with this is it's slightly incomplete. So our group felt that it should really include not just a nice guideline, but perhaps neonatal intestinal obstructions um, as a previous presentation for someone who comes to you with constipation, or those with genetic predispositions, not only family history, but you know more commonly things like uh, Down syndrome and the rest of the syndromes that you are fairly familiar with, which are associated with Hirschsprungs. So if you group all these features, you can call them red flags. And some of the consideration you should take before uh, performing a rectal biopsy, certainly I, I feel that's important, is that there are a large number of constipations, children out there. And as surgeons, we have concerns about missing Hirschsprungs as a diagnosis. So we are on the side of wanting to do a rectal biopsy. But we also know that all the red flags symptoms were not specific to Hirschsprung disease. And there's procedural related morbidity involved. So 
how do we get the threshold right for doing a rectal biopsy for our patients under these circumstances? So I, I just wanted to talk about a study that we did uh, less than a year ago, looking at incidence of non hush brown biopsy, basically saying that if we put someone through the biopsy process, who will turn up to have a, a negative result and how many of them. And I also want to talk about the predictability of non hush brown biopsies. Are the red flags alone enough, as in absent of red flags, sorry, or can we use something in addition to that, such as children older, over six months of age, in addition to the absence of red flags? Would that be enough to predict someone does not have Hirschsprung and therefore we don't need to do that many rectal biopsies? So over a four year period, we uh, retrospectively look at our data of um, patients who underwent rectal biopsies. Uh, 187 children, um, and some needed more than one biopsy, and 197 were included. So there were 84 suction rectal biopsy and 113 open rectal biopsy. Uh, we've excluded those who had uh, post pull through that we wanted to check whether persistent symptoms were due to uh, transitional pull through or egg or egg ganglionic pull through, and we excluded those. And this is a brief overview of the results. So having excluded the, the group who are post pulled through, what you can see is that uh, there are patients who have conclusive biopsy in one go and others uh, who are inconclusive. Every single one needed a repeat biopsy uh, to determine whether they were Hirschsprung or non Hirschsprung diagnosis. And we found that our negative biopsy rate was 78%, which is 22% positive pickup rate when we try and did in um, biopsies on children that we suspected having Hirschsprungs. So this is slightly better than the historical data of 12% from Leeds and Southampton. And we then look at these two cohorts, the non hirschsprung versus the Hirschsprung groups, it is quite apparent and simple to understand that those who do not have red flags, those who are older with a median age of 22 months, uh, but greater than six months of age, and those who are female, and those who undertake open rectal biopsy were more likely to be non hirschsprung disease. I just draw your attention to the bit of absent red flags where in the absence of red flag, seven patients still had Hirschsprung disease. And therefore we look at whether or not um, age has any impact uh, with regards to you know, red flags. And what you see in the red circles are what we expect to be the case. If you're very young and you have red flags, you're more likely to get Hirschsprung disease. That's true. But if you are very old or greater than six months and you, are, you have no red flags, you're more likely to get a non hirschsprung disease. That's clear. But these seven patients who are um, having no red flags um, presented late, understandably, had hirschsprung disease. And I've listed them down here. You might recognize some of these presentation in your own practice. But what they are are these patients are over six months and they presented quite late. Uh, some needed manual evac and others just couldn't wean off the laxative. Some had faltering growth. Uh, some referred to quite old, four years and six years. One of these patients needed a repeat. So there were six patients, but seven biopsies done. Um, so on and so forth. And there was a UTI as well who were under the urologist with a history of intractable constipations that we finally want to do a rectal biopsy for. So as you can see, all of them needed an open rectal biopsy because they were in the older groups. And one among these patients who were Hirschsprung disease, who had no red flags, was a female. So what can we make out of this? Well, I'll, I'll come to that shortly after, but I wanted to draw your attention to another point, which is if you look at how 
the patients who had no Hirschsprung disease, 63% of them ended up with open rectal biopsy. So that's a big number. That means two thirds of our patient that we subject to a rectal biopsy, open rectal biopsy had not actually had Hirschsprung's and they have already gone through a general anesthesia. So it is a morbidity certainly in, the, in its own right. And if you do a univariate uh, regression analysis and multivariate regression analysis, you know, it's, we picked up that, you know, should be correct for age and sex. The absent red flags uh, is associated with five times more likely uh, negative biopsy. So in conclusion, uh, what we got from our study was that the rectal biopsy pickup rate was 22%. That does mean that 78% had non hirschsprung biopsy. But quite importantly, two thirds of these uh, actually undertook an open rectal biopsy. A red flag was clinically relevant for risk stratifications because we've demonstrated that but sensitivity wasn't that good and specificity was reasonable, but certainly not enough to uh, exclude Hirschsprungs. So an absent red flags in older children still carry 9% chance of being Hirschsprungs. And if you have absent red flags in being a girl, very low chance, but it's not zero of having Hirschsprung disease. So, Red flags is useful for risk stratification, but it does not really exclude her from the disease and is independent of age. So age doesn't really matter, contrary to our initial hypothesis that it could potentially be beneficial. So I just want to stop here and just ask you to think about why you know this is important. Because I think we've demonstrated that we've done a lot of biopsies in response to our colleagues referring patients who have constipation. But actually, that process does carry morbidity and it's probably not very efficient use of our resources. So I thought that there are three points that are relevant uh, that I want to bring up in our discussions. Uh, should I carry on, Naeem? Yes, please. Right. So the first point I want to talk about is that what is the implication of a late diagnosis of Hirschsprung disease? Because surely if, uh, you know, if we miss the Hirschsprung diagnosis early on in life and not even and kind of diagnose it sometime later, does it really matter? Well, our study, uh, which was presented in BAPS last year, uh, actually, over a 20 years period, we had a significant number of patients that presented late. And we found that if you have a presentation over three years um, of age, then the late diagnosis was actually associated with increased morbidity. Not only you got higher stoma rates, but following pull through, there's major complication is greater. And the more likelihood of having a redo pull through probably because the colon is a bit more dilated and the blood supply is a bit more uh, compromised when you do a pull through. And, and many patients in terms of functions ended up requiring enema, uh, more in the delay groups compared to the timely diagnosis groups. And persistent stoma was also increased. So, we realize therefore as surgeons that if we have a late diagnosis of Hirschsprung disease, it's not good for our patients. And we talk a little bit about age, but I just wanted to point out here why it is slightly relevant, because as we say, older children greater than six months actually accounted for more than half of all the patients that we did a rectal biopsy in our four year period. But only 12% of this group had actually a Hirschsprung disease. So clearly, we're not doing this well. Um, and older children required an open rectal biopsy under general anesthesia. So it's not without you know, its own problems. Although I must say, you know, my colleagues and, and myself rarely find that this results in any major complications as a result of the GA, but it's nonetheless a general anesthetic. It does take up time 
and resources. And, and therefore, risk stratification, when you think about it, is only particularly relevant for older children and not that relevant for babies where you can do a suction record biopsy on the bedside. So the question is, can we therefore screen these patients, the older group of patients, for the need for open rectal biopsy? And this comes on to my third point, which is, do we have an alternative to? And from my humble, in my humble opinions, I think there are three ways uh, potentially you can change uh, the current state of play. One is punch biopsy, another one is contrast enema, and thirdly, potentially endorectal manometry. Because this may offer us an alternative to look into. I'll be really grateful for your thoughts and your experience in any of these. But just to talk about punch biopsy first, uh, one of my colleagues, Richard England, actually does this. Uh, but um, this is described uh, quite a while back, uh, I think in 1993, but it was published again by the Japanese uh, Yoshimaru with 957 patients over 30 years where everybody undertook punch biopsy. And you can see they call this a is that an S, well, basically a, a sigmoidoscopy uh, biopsy forceps in our, in our terms. And what it talks about is that you can use a blood bottle and drill a hole of about six millimeter and using that hole to then push against the, uh, the mucosa of, uh, of the baby's rectum or, or your child's rectum. And, and if you mark three centimeter, one, two, and three, for example, you can determine at the level above dentate lines where you want to take a biopsy from. And with this sort of approach, it was impressive to see that the, uh, the inconclusive biopsy rate was only 4%, which means 96% of the time, this gives you a really good biopsy and only 0.1% of the patients, which is actually one in the cohort of nine, 950 actually, uh, who is a patient with liver disease that actually had bleeding. And that is still a very, very good outcome, I thought. But the important thing about this is that the Japanese was able to do it in the outpatients and sometimes needing sedation if the child was a bit anxious, but no general anesthetic. And you wonder, you know, whether we could practice this. I must say that I'm slightly skeptical about our ability to achieve this in the Western world. Uh, I think our children are used to, or our parents perhaps are more used to children not suffering. Not that, you know, not that, you know, in any part of the world parents are able to bear with that. But I think there is a, there is a, a pressure from clinician side that feels that when children are old enough to remember the trauma of a procedure, we generally tend not to subject them to a procedure uh, that is perceived to be uncomfortable like this. So although punch biopsy may be helpful in some parts of the world, um, it may be difficult to apply in the UK. Another quite commonly practiced uh, investigations in many parts of the world, but not so much in the UK is contrast enema. And many papers uh, which demonstrated the usefulness of contrast enema. Um, and I want to draw your attention to one of them, which is uh, from Dr. Levitt's group when he was doing Buffalo in New York. Basically quite a nice study looking at contrast enema, of course, taking into account of symptoms. And if you have the symptoms, one of these three, plus the use of contrast enema to demonstrate the uh, transition zone, or another term of you know, rectal sigmoid inversions, you may be able to, uh, well, the group certainly believe that it has got a role in avoiding uh, significant proportions of patients undergoing rectal biopsy. So this is how the study was done and 50 Hirschsprungs and 50 um, idiopathic constipation children were compared 
uh, at least one symptoms presence of all these four uh, features, or all these three features, sorry, you'll be able to pick up Hirschsprung disease 98%, but 60% of uh, idiopathic constipation will still have one of these symptoms. But if you then combine it with contrast, i.e. one of the four features presence, you 100% picked up the Hirschsprung, but still you may pick up 64% uh, idiopathic constipations. In other words, you would not miss Hirschsprung disease if you use all these features uh, together. And in, in other words, if you do not have any of these four features, delay passage in meconium, abdominal distension, vomiting, and a normal contrast IE, then 36% of idiopathic constipation can be excluded and avoiding a rectal biopsy. So it seems very elegant and well described and really nice paper to read, but I'm still having my doubts because although if you look at some recent papers in, you know, the first paper from Germany, uh, sensitivity of contrast enema 74% and specificity 95%. And obviously these patients went to have a contrast enema because they have got some symptoms of concern. And also if you look at a Pakistan paper, uh, you know, the sensitivity and specificity was very comparable, pretty good but not really good enough, even though if you take into consideration and delay evacuations of 24 hours. So, so I think it then makes me feel that it's important to address anorectal manometry because this is kind of the new kit on the block, but, but it's not that new. It's, it's been used for you know at least over a decade, if not two decades. Um, by some specific unit who have the skills to do this. And, and essentially it is a test to demonstrate uh, the presence or absence of rectal anal inhibitory reflex. And, and you do it by putting a balloon into the rectum, inflate the balloon and uh, basically at different time points. Typically in these day of age with a child awake, um, with the help of uh, play specialist. And this is how endorectal manometry is able to exclude Hirschsprung disease. And this is a slide I borrowed from Dr. Mark Scott from the Royal London Hospital. And with a good resting tone, if you insert your probes um, into the rectum, and once you inflate the balloon, you should see that the anal tone should decrease demonstrating a positive rectal anal inhibitory reflex, which is normal. And in the presence of this, one could say that there isn't an evidence of Hirschsprung disease because the anus is able to relax. And this is a chapter on RARE that was published by Stuart Cleves groups um, and basically showing exactly the same things in a high uh, resolution and rectal manometry where red demonstrates quite a high pressure, uh, certainly purple, even higher pressure. So if you inflate the balloons um, and basically what you see is down in the anal canal, there's a drop in the pressure, but it will recover. And traditionally we accept a drop of more than 25% from the baseline uh, is enough to tell us that there is a presence of rare and therefore excludes Hirschsprung disease. Now the question is, how good is this test? Well, first of all, let's look at what NICE guideline says in 2010. It's very specifically telling us, do not use uh, anorectal geometry to exclude Hirschsprungs in children with chronic constipations. Very specific. And we all uh, bite by that. But if you look at the evidence that's led to these um, recommendations, and for those who are not clear, uh, NICE's National Institute of Clinical Excellence it is a UK uh, health body to determine which treatment is most cost effective. So, so if you look at the paper leading to that recommendations, which is a systematic review 
uh, published by Mark Beninga's group from uh, the Netherlands. It is interesting read to see that uh, anorectal uh, manometry uh, fares slightly less well than suction rectal biopsy, but significantly better than contrast enema. So I think it is clear that if we have to choose an alternative um, test, I would choose anorectal manometry over contrast enema. Um, and well, the question is, is it good enough? Is it good enough? Are we still likely going to uh, miss Hirschsprung disease if we just use this modality? And I was really quite pleased to see this paper came out two years ago uh, by Paul Brown's group, again in the Netherlands, um, looking at anorectal manometry that can reduce the number of rectal biopsies. So basically over a hundred patients they're prospectively done manometry and rectal biopsy for their patients and trying to see whether it matches the outcome. And basically the study was showing that if you do that manometry correctly, your negative predictive value is 100%. So what it is saying in other words is if you do an enorectal manometry correctly, you should be able to not miss a Hirschsprung disease. So, well, there seems to be evidence to support anorectal manometry is a good screening tool to exclude Hirschsprung disease. Um, and I think NICE guideline is a little bit behind on this, but we have a recent paper this year published in uh, JBGN, I think, uh, on, you know, Baspagan groups, uh, basically looking at whether there's a role of anorectal manometry in children with defecation disorder. And the first indications of using anorectal manometry in this paper is to exclude Hirschsprung disease. And Buspagan is a British Society of Pediatric and Gastroenterology and Hepatology, uh, so, and nutrition, sorry. So, so that's the group that represents our gastroenterology colleagues. So, it is interesting to see how things have evolved over time. And it may be that one day NICE may revise its recommendations, but until then, it is still something that we have to uh, think very carefully before embarking on. So, the, but the important thing about this paper is not just that, but more so because it gives you normal value. Because in the past, all the normal values for the pressure measurements in anorectal manometry was based on adults. But in this instance, this paper is the first paper that actually gives a standardized normal value that you can refer to and compare against. And one thing is interesting about anorectal manometry is that it helps with not just excluding Hirschsprungs, but it also has other benefits in children with constipation, because you can pick up things like uh, internal anal things like achalasia, or pelvic floor dyssynergia. So many children have big withholding behaviors. Uh, many of these we would just treat with Botox provisionally, but it'd be good to know. It'd be good to know, wouldn't it? Um, of course, one can argue that if you end up giving Botox, you're gonna go under general anesthetic anyway, and you're gonna do a rectal biopsy anyway. So is there any point? Um, I argue that there is a point because if you don't pick up any of these, the children's actually um, actually end up not having a general anesthetic and that's still a big proportion. But manometry is a specific skill that one has to learn and it's time consuming to, to do and you need a dedicated team, particularly the play specialist and a physiologist. So, so I think although it is a viable option, it may not be very viable and immediately available. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to, to sort of share with you my thoughts and some of the you know, uh, findings we've come to. Um, but I'm not sure whether um, you would agree with a logical pathway that looks a bit like this. Uh, this would be my last slide. Basically, I think that if you have suspected Hirschsprung disease and if you're under six months, where you have a 35% positive biopsy rate based on our data, I think 
you should really go ahead and do a suction rectal biopsy because if you wait long enough and it persists to have problems, then you will find that you may end up needing to do more. So if you are older than six months with red flags, you have a 21% chance of positive biopsy. Whereas if you do not have a red flag, you have a 9% chance of a positive biopsy, which makes sense. But I think personally, because the chance of positive pickup is still relatively low, perhaps this group should be subject to anorectal manometry. And I'm putting a question mark there is not a, it's not a definitive one. And if only rare is absent or inconclusive that one is subject for, to an open rectal biopsy. And that's my thought. And this is, and I just want to say Sukriya, uh, thank you very much for having me today uh, in your busy Saturday evening. And this is my beautiful hospital in Norwich and you're very welcome to pay us a visit um, and I'll be happy to, to hear your thoughts and have any discussions with you guys. Thank you very much. Uh, very well presented, Yue. Well done. Um, you have uh, comprehensively um, detailed the use of various modalities to diagnose. I know this is a very um, uh, topical issue for a lot of us. I think uh, you have given a very good scientific background around your conclusion. Um, can I take this opportunity to say some of my personal experiences over the years and, and Obviously, I do not deny that what you are saying is looking like the future to me. Uh, and, and I do not deny that uh, there is certainly a role for anorectal manometry, but you have rightly mentioned that it requires special skills. It requires a team. It requires investments by the hospital and the trust. And at the end of the day, there may be some possibilities that it may not avoid, still avoid certain um, unnecessary biopsies under GA. I think in terms of the red flag, what you have mentioned uh, before six months, there is no controversy at all. The, uh, the things remain debatable is what we do after six months. Is that right, Yuve? I you agree. agree. Yeah. Uh, and that's the group where it becomes a bit controversial. Having said so, that till we can uh, match the sensitivity and specificity of uh, anorectal manometry to what we have with the rectal biopsy as of today, we will always have a slight struggle in making the right decision. And talking about morbidity of the GA also is a little bit relative in terms of where it is being performed and whether it is being supported by the pediatric anesthetist or not. In the West, there are both pros and cons, again, that if we go with contrasted and anorectal manometry, it is also a very inconvenient procedure. It is not that straightforward we say that, but to do that in a six months beyond age group could become challenging how to manage the child. Having said so, I would accept that I do not personally have a great experience with anorectal manometry, but I certainly see what happens in our urodynamics rooms when we get children for other urodynamic studies, et cetera. So a balance is required and certainly the future is looking like that we'll get better and better and more efficient with our anorectal manometries. And certainly there may be a group where we will be able to avoid some unnecessary biopsy. We have become very restrictive over the years as well. We used to do quite more than what we do today. I can tell you that. Mm. Uh, and you rightly said that most of them turns out to be a negative. How I have taken personally the use of rectal biopsy is, is by making, uh, I obviously have done most of the time if I'm forced to go ahead and do an evacuation, 
I generally have made it as part of that procedure that if I'm doing a good manual evacuation, a good anal stretch, and then a biopsy, what it has achieved over the years is that a conclusive ruling out or ruling in of Hirschsprung. I have picked up only two Hirschsprungs, but I must have done more than 100 of these. But what I sell it to the parents is I'm not doing it for a rectal biopsy per se, uh, but as a combination procedure. And what I also don't sell to them that my good anal stretch is going to make a big change, but it does make a, some definite change in a good percentage of people who get going after we have, one is we have ruled out her sprungs, so we can convince the parents that this is not something mechanical or functional, but, but which can be supported with a more aggressive bowel management program. And that, that takes over the you know, patient towards the right course. So I would say that uh, I think you have done a very, very thorough analysis and I must commend you for uh, this thing, but I just wanted to add on these comments. So thank you for that. I'll, I'll see what our uh, colleagues from Pakistan says about this because they have a very different population um, and uh, the, the things may be quite different and uh, how they would think about this. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Menocha. For those of you who are not familiar, I'm sure you are, Mr. Menocha is my chief of pediatric surgery in Norwich. And, and I completely agree uh, with all the things that Mr. Menocha say. Um, I just wanted to made it slightly clearer in the sense that when we there are many reasons we bring children to theater and if we are in theater i completely agree that we should uh take the advantage of patient being under ga to have a manual evacuations and then do an enema and and do a, a rectal biopsy uh, may it be punch biopsy or open strip biopsy but i also uh, is a big proponent of uh, an anima uh, disimpaction. So many of my children ended up not needing to go under GA. And then, then the question is then, uh, you know, is the GA just to accommodate the rectal biopsy and at the same time we do the manual evac or is that that patient actually go for a manual evac and then we just do a rectal biopsy at the same time. And there is no doubt that um, it will influence one another. And, and I, I just, yeah, I completely agree. Otherwise, you know, most other things are very true, very true. In current practice, we still need a definitive diagnosis. <laughs> Rectal biopsy is the only way forward for older children. Uh, can I make a comment? Uh, can you hear me, Tan? Yeah, is that... Uh, uh, I, I'm Miftikhar John. Nice to meet so you. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Really, it's uh, very impressive that you brought all these, uh, uh, collected all this data, and really, it uh, is really very impressive data. Uh, I'd like to, you know, just add a few things. Number one, um, we uh, have got a totally different population. A lot of children who bring with chronic constipation, they even Hirschsprung's disease, they present very late, and therefore they don't have the classical picture of Hirschsprung's disease, but a lot of them are malnourished with a large tummy. And uh, they have got chronic constipation, but that is not detected in time. And therefore, you know, there is significant delay. And in these children, our barium enema is the, or gastrographin enema is the first uh, line of uh, action once they have uh, excluded functional constipation. And there, it does help in uh, many children. And actually, we are talking about a different population. And the new nets, of course, um, the role of enema is quite controversial. My, actually, my concern is more about the rectal biopsies, which we do and how we stain them. Uh, people don't understand that section rectal biopsy may not pick up the ganglia in all the patients. And you have to do special standing for that. And only centers who have got, a, you know, if they've got facilities for acetylcholine estrays or calretinin standing, they can help uh, to say with definite uh, uh, diagnosis that it's a Hirschsprung or not a Hirschsprung-like disorder or not. So that is another thing which is very important to understand. The third thing is uh, we actually, I was in uh, 
Kyushu University for a while in 1993. And they were doing anorectal manometry at that time. And I had you know, some experience of that. And we find that it is a good technique, uh, but it does, it's a very, very, uh, what you can say committed uh, procedure. So you have to have a very committed team to do it, who understands all the uh, procedure and can take the time to do it. And I agree with uh, Ashish who has uh, said that this is the same when you are doing aerodynamics. So you need a very committed team to do that. Unfortunately, with the workload which we are working in Pakistan, uh, uh, there is a big issue. You are not talking about uh, five uh, or 10 patients in a clinic. You are talking about, uh, 100 patients in a clinic, which is a big number. And uh, to have that sort of commitment is possible. When uh, you have got somebody, uh, uh, when you have got somebody who is really committed. So uh, we have to actually for, I think uh, what I'll suggest is you have got presented very excellent ideas. Uh, and um, uh, I'll suggest that my team in Pakistan, I'm in UAE by the way, in Abu Dhabi. So they should, uh, have uh, taking uh, your lecture as a baseline, they should start working on it and make up their own guidelines, which are, uh, you know, uh, which will be very, very useful in our setup. And that will be really helpful. All the other guidelines, uh, uh, because the histopathology itself in most of the centers, only the full thickness rectal biopsy will be feasible because they do only acetyl, uh, this uh, hemat, hemat, uh, uh, the standard, um, you see in stands and not the, uh, they don't do the special standing uh, and not, not all the centers, some of the center may do. So I think that is uh, what is important to understand. And uh, thank you so much for, you know, presenting such a nice uh, presentation and uh, giving a very thoughtful uh, discussion on the topic. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Jan. Um, I, I think in your population, it is really, really challenging to do uh, anorectal manometry it is very time consuming and you may not find that particularly cost effective either. Um, so yeah, I can understand, but, but I think if you have a late presenter and your contrast enema in theory should have a probably a pick, greater pickup rate because you would have a very, very dilated sigmoid by the time they come to you and they wouldn't have had a rectal washout, for example. So, so yeah, I, I think in your setup, it really is, is a very appropriate and I can't agree more. Um, our staining uh, generally, depending on which center you go to, if the specimen is sent fresh, we stain uh, HNE plus uh, acetylcholinesterase uh, and also looking for mucosa uh, carotenine um, if there's any diagnostic doubts. Uh, but if it's sent as a formalin, typically we'll only be able to get HND. Um, yeah, so so that's that's something that's maybe slightly different or maybe not too different. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Yes, uh, uh, you were there are some questions on the chat for you. Oh, can you? Uh, I will be able to see them. Is Naeem able to see them? I oh. think there is one or two for you. Mm. Naeem, do you mind reading that out? Uh, Jamal, can you do that? Because I had just a uh, issue. Yeah. Okay. Yes. There's this, there's this, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, there's this question from Javeria Kamar. She's asking that you mentioned two patients that developed constipation at one and two years of age. Were they absolutely fine before that with no symptoms? And second question is that what was the length of segment involved? Hmm. Very good questions. I, I don't know what the length of segment was involved, I must say. Um, we, when we review the data, uh, we just wanted to check whether it is a positive or negative for the purpose of this study. Um, in terms of uh, the patient who had Hirschsprung but presented late, uh, one was actually a baby with pyloric stenosis that came to us earlier on in life, but did actually have um, constipation issue, but on, only on very low dose of laxative. Um, but because they just couldn't take the laxative off when the child was a couple of years old, uh, the child you know, was referred by our gastroenterologist for a rectal biopsy. 
there were more than two actually, uh, quite, quite a few patients presented late, but most of them had actually, uh, in those group of set, well, six patients or seven biopsies, that group of patients, most of them uh, were over, well, the others were all over a year old, apart from the one with pyloric stenosis. So yeah, it is a bit unusual, isn't it? But that's, that's what it is. And that's why they presented late in the first place. I hope it, it answers the question. Okay. What's the other questions, uh, Dr. Jamal? Uh, no, there are not no questions actually. So, uh, Dr. Sajid has raised is... a hand. So, I hope he has a question, Dr. Sajid. Dr. Arshad also has raised his hand. So oh, yeah. if you have a question, you can unmute your mic and ask the question. Uh, thank you very much, Stan, for presenting um, and this topic of rectal biopsy. Uh, I have also gone through this frustration of doing uh, rectal biopsies and then coming as negative for Hirschsprung disease. And I also, a few years back, searched the literature and came with similar uh, red flags, age less than six months and symptoms starting in neonatal period and abdominal distension and failure to thrive. And I have modified uh, my index sus suspicion for rectal biopsy and, and now I do much less biopsy than what I used to do maybe 15 years back. Uh, I think, uh, what you are highlighting is one is that to diagnose Hirschsprung disease of patients, of cohort of patients who present with constipation. Uh, my worry is that as the majority of these patients do not have Hirschsprung disease who present late with constipation. And as your numbers are also suggesting that 63% uh, will not have Hirschsprung disease. And uh, we, uh, you mentioned the barium anima study from Pakistan that we have published uh, last year in QRS. And we also found that barium anima may help to streamline few of those patients, but still uh, there is a cohort of patients who we may not be able to diagnose. Uh, your uh, suggestion for interrectal manometry and other is also, I think, valuable for uh, making a diagnosis of those patients who do not have a Hirschsprung disease, whether they have a sphincter ecclesia, because their biopsy will be positive for ganglion cells, and still they will have symptoms. And if we have an interrectal biometry, we can very conclusively diagnose anal canal ecclesia and our ultra short segment Hirschsprung disease, and that can also be treated. That also highlights that uh, we also need to develop more f facilities along with interrectal myometry with the um, intestinal motility studies and all those to treat these constipated patients because constipation is a big problem now in Pakistan also. In every day, we see about uh, three, four patients children with severe constipation and the uh, if you ask the mother they are passing daily stool but they present with abdominal pain and you do the x-ray and you see uh, a big fecalomas uh, seen in the x-rays and then you put them on animas and they become better and their pain settles down and uh, and what I have seen is that after in a selected patient who are not uh, be getting better with your aggressive management, when you do a rectal biopsy, you again empty the rectum, you do uh, some stretching while you are doing the biopsy and biopsy also releases the internal sphincter ecclesia and they become better for some time, two, three months. And then again, they come back with constipation. So these are my comments on this topic. Thank you very much for your talk. Thanks, Dr. Asha. Thanks, Dr. Asha.
Do you guys okay, uh, use Photoshop by any chance? You, you were, yeah. I have a question that uh, like uh, if in a patient at uh, Professor Shukal asks the saying that uh, usually we see a patient who is three to four years of age presenting with chronic constipation and on x-rays and uh, typically on the abdominal examination he has huge lumps and bumps of the uh, fecal matter which is infected and uh, uh, you do a rectal biopsy and if it turns out to be positive for the ganglion cells and uh, how, how do you proceed particularly in those patients? What schema do you follow? Uh, so, Naeem, did I hear correctly that you've got a three to four year old who had a rectal biopsy is ganglionic, so normal. How do you proceed? Yeah. So, uh, interesting questions. And in a sense, I think many people will do different things if, you know. Um, so, personally, um, I. I tend to have a high threshold uh, to, if they don't have red flags, then, you know, they don't get a rectal biopsy. They get a very uh, concentrated uh, medical management under my care. Um, and then, you know, only if they fail that they will undertake a rectal biopsy. But say if they do end up with rectal biopsy and it's normal, then, you know, at that sort of age, uh, most of the children would have some sort of withholding behavior. So my approach would be to offer Botox uh, in the absence of anorectal manometry. Yeah, because most units are still not able to provide that. Uh, and and the, the idea of Botox is just breaks the, the cycle um, of withholding behavior. Um, and hopefully it makes a difference. My personal um, experience is about 50% success. Um, but I tend to find that many of these chronic constipation children having relatively dilated uh, rectum. So I would uh, use a uh, stimulant such as Senna at a high dose, uh, two milligram per kilo. Uh, I usually go slightly lower than that to start with and build it up. Yeah. So so that would be my overall general approach. I may not use Botox as much as some of my other colleagues, um, but the group at, at Evelina has got 80% success rate with their Botox. And I don't know whether that's because um, they use manometry quite regularly and they choose the right groups where this pressure is a bit higher and then not the groups that are lower. So. So I suspect that may be selecting the right group of patients. So that also makes me wonder whether manometry has a, a role in selecting these patients. Uh, so you, can... Particularly go for the, for the intestinal neural dysplasia or other Hirschsprung variants? Yeah, I suppose if you can demonstrate the absence of rare in the presence of ganglion cells, then yes, then uh, which is one of the reasons Botox is used uh, in case that's the case. But uh, where, where many centers do not have manometry. So yeah, so that would be the treatment, right? If it's uh, ISA, you give Botox. Yeah, so that's, that would be the treatment of choice. Yeah. Now, uh, what about the CISMARC studies or other uh, like uh, uh, colonic studies? Yeah, which is one of the, the things that when I see children in manometry, um, with constipation in clinic, uh, they will receive a cis marker, yeah, as, as our transit study we call it. And they, to be honest, um, the, yeah, the traditional way of talking about rectal evacuatory disorder was this, uh, you know, uh, pancolonic disease is, is ar somewhat arbitrary. Um, but, but I think if it completely empties and you are relatively reassured, um, but if it's not, then I think it gives parents the, the, the assurance that there is a significant problem here and do take the medicine. So yes, we do use that. Uh, then can I ask you uh, two more questions? Uh, one, how do you do bowel management for functional constipation? because I think our team will be very much interested to understand that. And are we missing the intestinal neuronal dysplasia because um, about 
10, 20 years back, it was one of the very hot topic. And now suddenly we don't see that much discussion on intestinal neuronal dysplasia. So is it, uh, are we, uh, is, are we getting less patients or is it just that um, we are diagnosing Hirschsprungs more in a proper way? Um, so, yeah, I'll quickly answer the second question because I have very little experience with IND. It's all over the literature uh, and it's Professor Puri's uh, has repeatedly been publishing this area that has got the most experience. Uh, so, so I really can't easily answer that um so i don't have experience with that uh, i suspect it's um it's again you know that you do not have the facility that the irish group has then you may not be able to uh undertake the same level of detail investigations so therefore it doesn't get diagnosed as commonly perhaps i don't know um in terms of bowel management uh, everyone does it slightly differently uh, I pretty much follows uh, Dr. Levitt's protocol, um, but, um, and functional constipations or not. Uh, but I think my experience with functional constipations is they generally do respond well to uh, laxative uh, if you manage to disimpact them. Uh, and you have to, so disimpaction is, is really the first step. And if they come with a rectal fecaloma, uh, I personally use um, high enema with uh, olive oil to soften the pool. And then about half an hour, an hour later, I give uh, phosphate enema uh, tailored to the patient's age. And that almost always successfully disimpact without necessarily needing co to go for manual evacuations. Um, and quite a few patients uh, have in the past failed well, sorry, let me finish that. So once you've disimpacted, I, I would almost always have to reduce their mobicle because with a dilated rectum, um, their sensation is very deficient. And to then soften the pool further makes the sensation even less. So I, I still keep on some mobicle to make the stool not too hard, but I usually then start Senna at a very high dose as Dr. Levitt has taught uh, at the, you know, as a starting point, uh, it was recommended at two milligram per kilo. That's a very high dose for a lot of my patients. So I usually go cut back by about two thirds of that and then build it up. Uh, one important point is I do very close follow up with my patients. All of them have my emails. If they, if they have come to the point of needing bowel management uh, and they will have to send me a bowel diary uh, weekly and, and the first four weeks I think is the most important and if you can adjust the dosage uh, according to response and uh, making sure that they do not have soiling in between no abdominal pain and with Senna you expect usually within 12 hours of taking the medicine they will get a bowel opening and if they don't do that uh, I typically will have a low threshold of increasing the dose further uh, and based on that response I mostly will be able to get uh, patients uh, under control in terms of getting regular bowel opening and no soiling. For those who fail that process, then uh, they will undertake bowel management uh, through the enema route. And my starting point would be to do a rectal biopsy uh, to rule out Hirschsprung's. So, so that's, that's when I start, yeah. Uh, and, and once they go under GA, I also do an on-table contrast uh, to determine the volume of uh, rectal fluid required to achieve uh, filling up the whole colon, in which case I can then uh, use that as a guide to my uh, enema regime. And, and all I then need to do is just titrate my stimulant dose. So uh, Pena and Levitt's group has described using glycerin and, uh, uh, and, and you know, uh, and uh, oil. Yeah. Castor oil, I think, but we, we simply do not use that uh, in the UK. Glycerin is not really licensed to use. So I typically use uh, bicycle uh, rectal enema, uh, 2.74 milligram per mil, and starting at about two to three ml. And then I'll just cut back or increase. And I usually uh, in the past have uh, admitted the children for between four and seven days. 
and see that they do make a difference on a daily basis, uh, radiologically and clinically. Uh, and then if, uh, if they show that they're emptying well on the regime, they do not uh, have uh, soiling in between, then that regime is correct and they go home with that regime for their enema. Yeah. And that few days staying in is important for them to learn how to use uh, the, the device. Uh, we typically use Peristine, uh, Kufora, and Aqua Flush. Those, those are the brands, but I don't think it really matters too much. Um, and after that, uh, patients will get a uh, one month follow up phone call, uh, followed by three months follow up face to face. Uh, and, and then uh, I usually then pass on to the clinical nurse specialist. So that would be my previous hospital's regime. I think when you go to a new hospital, every hospital does it slightly differently. I will, will kind of work around that a bit. Yeah. And just uh, to add into it, uh, you know, we found that a lot of patients who have got functional constipation, they do have anal fissure. And actually, that may be primary or secondary, but they do have uh, most, uh, not, if not all of them, but there is a significant number who will have it. So what we do is that we do advise them warm baths uh, three times a day for 10 minutes. And then yeah. we use Xylocan jelly to uh, the local area after the warm baths. And that does help uh, to release the spasm which they have got due to anal fissure. So I think um, uh, I agree with the rest of your things. And uh, I think for uh, our patients who are really chronically constipated, neglected, uh, and who have got these secondary things, uh, they have to be taken care of at the same time. Mm. Dr. Jan, do you just use silocaine with no um, muscle relaxer, such as GTN or um, uh, sort of calcium yeah. channel blockers? Well, you know, this is the one which is easily available in the pharmacy, and uh, we just use it. It is very cheap, and uh, our population is a very, very uh, special population because we have to devise something which will everybody can afford and we can make a standard uh, treatment. So we just use Xylocan. I don't know whether it works or not because Xylocan doesn't get absorbed very quickly. Uh, we can't use uh, Prelocan here because of the risk of uh, complication associated with Prelocan. So we just use Xylocan, by, uh, but I do find that it helps the patient to relax. Uh, but the warm baths definitely help a lot in relaxing the sphincters. There is no doubt about it. And uh, uh, with the warm baths, with the initial evacuation, and with the maintenance, with the laxatives, uh, most of the even very bad ones, they will be, uh, uh, you know, they will respond. So I, uh, I, you know, this is the more or less same what we use. The only thing which I'm scared is the use of stimulant uh, laxatives. Uh, okay. If you uh, advise them and our patients are not very educated, if they continue to use them for a long time, they will develop uh, secondary complications like inertia of the intestine because these are stimulant. So I'll prefer to use Movicol or Lactulose, which is a more, uh, you know, not a stimulant uh, laxative. So I think that is what uh, most of our people do in Pakistan. But we also have one very interesting, uh, some local remedies, and that is Esparol. It's a, it's a natural product. It's a bulk producing uh, product and it will, uh, uh, it will uh, absorb water and not get absorbed. And if used in proper amount, it will help many children in relieving their constipation. So I think there is a, we have to adapt according to our own circumstances. And, uh, uh, but uh, thank you so much for this very nice demo, uh, you know, uh, uh, for explaining this. Uh, in detail about the uh, bowel uh, management. Yeah. Right, thank you. So really enjoy listening to use a silocaine and warm bath. I will use that as my first line treatment as well, in which case I, I think it's worth trying and it makes sense. Can yeah. I just make a little comment on this? Yeah. New way? Um, yeah. Yeah. No what I'll say is that yes, uh, um, one thing is that since we have got the what we call disinfection regime, the need for manual evacuation has re really reduced a lot. Mm. And I would sort of follow the same thing that we'll start with a disinfection regime and along with enemas, as you suggested, sometime in, invariably 
nine out of 10, you don't need to go for any sort of uh, surgical manual evacuation. In terms of the management of the fissure, I'm a big fan of just using SITS baths and Vaseline, which effectively works the same way. I'm slightly worried about xylocaine because if somebody has used xylocaine on an open wound before it starts working and uh, it's an analgesic effect, actually xylocaine uh, lubricants are very irritant. So some of the children may actually go into more spas with it, but it could be a different experience um, with different people. But to say it sits path with some sort of uh, just an application of Vaseline jelly relaxes them. And that's what I found useful. So I just wanted to share that with all of you. Mm -hmm. uh, comment about uh, the, in, um, you know, uh, IND. And as you rightly said that there was a lot of literature from Ireland, but then over the years it has sort of, um, the interest has been subsided or whatever, but I think it is a subset of uh, functional constipation. And eventually um, it's, it needs management according to its severity. And it's difficult uh, and it's still not very well defined. And certainly in UK, uh, we haven't gone into looking at it in a more detailed way. So we may be missing some of these subcategories. Thank you. You have, we have a question. What kind of rectal washes you use for patients who present with uh, enterocolitis? Enterocolitis for Hirschsprungs. Yeah. Uh, just, just normal saline. Um, yeah. Um, so, if uh, so, when they need washouts and when they come to hospital, uh, that's that's what most of us would use uh, normal saline. Um, and many units would use a rough guide of twenty mL per kilo. But uh, I personally will. Uh, obviously, bear that in mind, but I also would uh, wash until clear for enterocolitis. Yeah. Do, do people use something with antibiotics or anything else? Have you any experience yeah. of, of uh, use of vancomycin anema in case of enterocolitis or strength related? No, I, I haven't, but I can imagine it may potentially be helpful. Is that your experience, Professor Salim? We are practicing here in Children's Hospital Lahore, and we have a good result with the vancomycin, uh, giving an anema. What's the dose? Our cases, usually they, when they present, they are very uh, in advanced stage. They have a, uh, a much advanced uh, 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 husband related enterocolitis. And uh, we actually started this vancomycin anema, and we have a good result with this. Excellent. One, one, one question, I do agree with uh, Sheesh and Iftikhar, uh, our population is somewhat different and we have a limited facilities and we actually are left in majority of the cases with 90% of the cases with open rectal biopsy. Uh, suction rectal biopsy, although it is a very old technique and uh, uh, still this is a availability of a stain, a styloculine stain, a styloculine stain, uh, stain is still a challenge in Pakistan and it is practiced in only few centers. Manometry is available in few centers, uh, just in Karachi and uh, Lahore, but not widely practiced, and usually done by gastroenterologists, and uh, still the results are uh, not dependable. Still, we are widely practicing uh, open rectal biopsy, uh, uh, which is uh, done by eosin, uh, uh, hemotoxylene eosin stain. And uh, we, majority of the pediatric surgeons, they believe on, uh, they depend upon this. Uh, I do agree with you. We should move forward in case of uh, manometry. And uh, we can rule out so many cases of, uh, uh, with the help of manometry. But my uh, question, uh, advancing the question of Ifukhar Jan, uh, Hirschsprung related disorders like uh, neuronal colonic dysplasia, immaturity of ganglia, hypoganglionosis, as once upon a very widely uh, narrated by uh, Prem Puri. What is your, um, can you further share your experience about this? Uh, will we miss on manometry these cases? 
Um, the bottom line is, I think um, my experience would only be limited to, you know, anal sphincters, achalasia, and Hirschsprung's. Um, you know, the hypoganglionosis IND is not something that uh, I think most of our labs would, you know, regularly report. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, in the last 10 years, I have certainly not come across anyone uh, with those alternative diagnoses. So, so I think if anything at all, I might have to hear your experience about this. Just only, uh, I have already highlighted, we are very limited in availability of stains. We are already left with hematoxylin EOC in stain and depending upon full thickness rectal biopsy in Pakistan. Yes. We have not even availability of hysterical stress training in Pakistan in majority of the cases. Right. Yeah, same here. Um, it's not something that I come across regularly. Uh, anyone who has more experience, I'll be very pleased to hear your experience. Uh, only uh, when, uh, you know, in Japan, what they were doing is patients who have got a positive, uh, who have a presence of ganglia cells with a positive acetylcholine estrase. So these were the patients who probably had uh, abnormal ganglia and these were dysgenetic ganglia. And these are were the one who were further classified into intestinal and neuronal dysplasias and hypoganglionosis and, egg and uh, megaganglionosis. All these different terminologies were given. But what I feel is that uh, as we have uh, progressed, our uh, diagnostic rate for Hirschsprung disease has improved and our scanning capabilities and uh, uh, all the other things have improved. Therefore, we are seeing making more uh, confident diagnosis of Hirschsprung's disease. And therefore the number which we are getting for uh, uh, with the, who are not uh, uh, Hirschsprung's disease is less or where there is a doubt is less. I think that is one of the factors. The other thing is centers who are only doing, relying on only one biopsy, for example, HNE standing for ganglia cells only and not doing uh, special standing, they will miss some of these patients because some of the patients may have the ganglia cell, but at the same time, they may be calretinin negative or they may be positive for acetylcholine stress. So these were the these are the patients who need further uh, investigation for Hirschsprung's uh, for Hirschsprung's like disorders and uh, similar uh, intestinal neuronal dysplasia. So uh, I think we need to look more into it and uh, try to get uh, standing at least two stands at least for all these patients uh, acetylcholine stress and uh, the rectal uh, uh, standal HNE standing. Yeah. They um, from Dr. Puri's previous lectures, um, the group will require, once you suspect, once you rule out Hirschsprung, then you suspect variant Hirschsprung disease, disease um, they would do a full thickness biopsy. And, and as you say, all the specialized staining will have to be used, including HNE, all the histochemistry, immunohistochemistry, sewer staining. And they also do electron microscopy, if I remember correctly. So, so those are the things that not many units have uh, the facility to achieve, I think is the reality. So, so yes, we, we must be missing some as Mr. Minocha has mentioned. Okay, thank you, Wade. So do we thank have you. any other questions from the group? Before okay. everybody leaves, can I just thank you to my friends? I see a lot of friends which I have met after a long time. Um, and also convey my best wishes from the International Affairs Committee of BAPS, of BAPS. And, um, and, uh, um, and I hope that we can continue with these deliberations uh, more regularly with um, uh, your association in future. Uh, I really enjoyed, and I must say, I'm proud that uh, Yuvi Chan has joined our team. And he's a, he's a very um, enthusiastic and a very capable uh, young surgeon. And I'm sure he will um, fly uh, the flag of uh, pediatric surgery high, not only in Norwich uh, or UK, but internationally. Um, and uh, we can have more collaboration with Pakistan as well.
Thank you, everybody. And thank you again, UA, for your brilliant and excellent deliberations. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that word, your kind words, Mr. Minocha. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, at the end, I would like uh, I to invite Professor Iftikharjan to say a few words on the behalf of Association of the Pediatric Surgeons of Pakistan. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chen. I think I don't have any words to thank you. Really, really, I enjoyed very thoroughly your presentation. It was really very elaborate, very, very informative. And I'm sure all of our youngsters uh, were keenly waiting and th this shows all are present from the start till now. So this means they really enjoyed your meeting. Thank you so much. We look forward to see you again on this forum with some other presentations. And uh, also, you know, feel uh, whenever you have got any meeting or any conference, which uh, you think that that will help our youngsters and our surgeons, please do involve uh, them. Uh, our teams are very, very receptive. And we have got a very wonderful <coughs> pediatric surgery family which uh, joins meeting actually more or less every week or two weeks. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot and really appreciate your efforts and your uh, hard work actually. And thank you so much. I also wish to thank Ashish because uh, Ashish is one of our old friends. And uh, thank you so much Ashish. I was really um, looking forward to see you sometime and it was a pleasure to see you here today. And um, really, um, you know, this collaboration is really very, very helpful. And uh, we are so glad that because of you guys present, it makes it really uh, very, very informative. Our people cannot travel abroad, you know, it's not easy. And now nobody can travel actually. So this, uh, uh, these meetings and these uh, online meetings are really helping improvement, improving in our, our system. And um, uh, if, uh, if you attend some of our meeting, you will be surprised to know the amount of work these young people are doing. And we, our young team is really, really very, very impressive. They have now, we have got now pediatric surgical center all over the country in most of the cities before it was not possible. And even in the most remote area, actually in Sawat last year, they opened a center and just few months back, it got recognized for training in pediatric. So you just imagine that the remotest of the remote area has got so much uh, uh, facilities that it got, uh, uh, you know, accepted for training. So I think uh, you guys are doing a great job and it's a great job not for you actually, it's a great job for uh, the patients which we are treating. The message which they will take today, it will go a long way in treating their patients and these uh, young surgeons, they are really, they take them very positively and uh, I hope that uh, it's going to help all of them. And I also take this opportunity, I'm sure they uh, inform you that we are having our annual Congress in, in February next year. And uh, I think Dr. Salim, Professor Salim will send some official invitation and it will be a player if you can join us and do uh, some presentations and you can uh, send uh, some lecture. And Ashish, please do join us in the yeah, annual- Sure, always. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would love to. Just one more thing that uh, Norwich actually runs an international teaching training program. And if you are interested, we can send a link of that to you as well. That will be great. And that will be really wonderful. And I'll ask uh, our uh, uh, team, uh, young uh, youngster team to coordinate it with you so that they can yes. have a regular meeting. And yeah. it, this program is directed towards the postgraduate examination, especially FRCS training as well. Wow, wonderful. So guys, now ball is in your court, so you can start working on that. And thank you so much. It was a pleasure again to see you all. And, uh, you know, also congratulations to all the youngsters who joined and stayed with us um, till the end. Thanks again. Thanks. Thanks, Naeem. And uh, thanks, uh, Professor Salim and all the organizers, Nabila from Pakistan team. Thank you so much for, uh, and, uh, you know, our president, um, Professor Anayat, he also conveyed his regards and uh, thanks to all the uh, participants and especially to Dr. Tan and Ashish. Please uh, accept uh, his uh, uh, heartiest uh, thank you. Uh, thanks from uh, his side. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I've learned a lot from you. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and allowing okay. me to take part and learn. Thank okay, you. Good night. See you all. Have, Have a, a nice evening. Nice evening. Shukriya. You.